but to our uh, guest speaker, Yuri. Now, I'm going to get you to pronounce your last name for us. You're not in Holly. There's a Canadian version of those trees. Okay. And Yuri is going to talk about uh, the Maritime Beef Test Nation. Yeah. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah. Hello. Uh, it is a, a great pleasure to be here. There is nothing more interesting for a scientist than to talk to industry. So, we are here today really to celebrate diversity. <laughs> and if, if I'm here today talking to you about cows and heifers and whatever, it's because uh, I start there. That's like uh, what my grandpa used to have 30 years ago. Those are gear uh, cows. They have very big heads, ears and horns. And also they produce a lot of milk. So this was like uh, the imprint that a uh, little kid had about the livestock production and then it just moved on from there. And the same here, the same way here we talk about salaries. That's not the most popular uh, breed uh, that we have in the country, but also uh, is a, a sign, is a, for me is the, the healthiest thing about the beef industry, is the diversity. So the same way that we have salaries, uh, a couple of years ago I was talking to the Highland Cattle Producers Association. And so there is, that diversity is very important. You need to cultivate that. You need to make sure that you have uh, as many diverse uh, animals uh, as you can have to make a very reliable uh, beef industry. And so my talk is really about bulls, but uh, a lot of that has to do with the heifers. So it will be a combination of the work that has been doing on the heifers and also the work that you have been doing on the bulls. Uh, I work at the Howes University and I'm very thankful uh, to the Maritime Beef Test Society. Uh, this entity is key for my work. Without the support of this uh, station here, I couldn't get a single uh, research trial done in <coughs> part of the country. So I'm very thankful for them. And most of the work that we'll be doing here, we'll be showing here, is based on what we did there over the past two years. So uh, there was a time that uh, this is how it takes to evaluate a bowl. You just go around it and look, take a look and say, oh yeah, deep chest and nice horns for those that like horns, uh, nice rump, whatever it is, but it's really a uh, physical appraisal. And things have been changing a lot, although a lot of the decisions are still made in this way. And I say this because uh, at the Maritime Beef Test Society, we work, we work really hard in, in developing this sales catalog with a lot of treats. And then at the end of the day, uh, a lot of people go there and like, oh yeah, I just buying the yellow bowl because I like the yellow bowl better and I heard that the yellow bowls are better. So there's a lot of education, a lot of work that needs to be done uh, uh, to really value what's under the skin. Because there's a lot of things that you can see when you check the blood, a lot of things that you can see when you check the semen. Not that empirical, the traditional knowledge is not important, but really complementary. We have a lot of tools, so we have, we have ways to build up on that. So basically, a quick outline of what I'll be presenting. When I first prepared this draft on Wednesday, I ended up with 191 slides. I was very excited about it, but then I had to cut it down, so now we're about 50, so we not, did not take the rest of your afternoon. Especially here today, I'm competing with a lobster dinner. So that's a very hard uh, competition. So uh, first thing that I want to, to bring up is really uh, why feed the fishes matters. I think a lot of people think that matters, but a lot, uh, a lot of people don't know how much it can matter. And then we talk about some of the biomarkers for feed fish that have been developing. A little bit of how we have been handling and evaluating the bulls. And then some associations that we have between feed efficiency and reproduction. And some other uh, wrap up comments at the end. So, uh, feed fish matters. Let's talk about this. This is back in Brazil when I was doing my master's on, with replacement heifers. And so basically, uh, the, the idea is pretty simple when you talk about feed efficiency. You have a different type of feed stuff that uh, using a, a cow or whatever is the animal, you'll be making profit a bit. And nowadays, you have a lot of weight for this, for the environmental concerns about it. So that's the, the simple equation. So you want to make this flow in a way better manner uh, to make the, the industry more profitable and also uh, less, uh, less of a treat to the environment. Uh, so this is some of the challenges that we have when we try to work with feed efficiency. First of one is to ensure that uh, when you improve feed efficiency, you don't, you don't affect negatively the eating experience. So make sure there's no uh, negative uh, effects on, on, on the meat quality. And second, 
you have some in other industries, pork and, and chicken, that way, way more efficient than us. This is pretty much uh, how much uh, fuel it, it burns to produce a kilo of chicken, pork and beef. And you see that for beef you need to drive way more to get the same uh, product. So we need to work on that somehow. And yes, find ways that you can be competitive besides the amazing taste of beef. How can we be more competitive to the, those other uh, livestock products? So the idea of feed efficiency in cattle uh, is pretty old. 1963, uh, this researcher from the uh, United States, Robert Koch, he did some work on that and he, he was the first person to define uh, residual feed intake. And when he did that, he was just accounted for body weight in evolution again. And then we have been doing some more work on that. And uh, we need to think a little bit of further because not uh, release the gain, but really the composition of the gain. That's really what really matters at the end of the day. So how much fat, how much lean tissue the animal is depositing. Because uh, when you see this graph here, the deposition of fat is quite different from, from lean. So if you don't account for the difference there, you might be making animal too lean uh, with the feed efficiency uh, selection. So that's why uh, when we do our work, we have been uh, considering all types of ultrasound assessment to compensate the difference in, in body composition. And for now on, uh, every time that I say about efficient animal, I will refer to the angel cow. And when I say inefficient, be the devil cow. So basically the angel cow is the one that you want. She eats a bit less and uh, ends up being more profitable. And the other one just works the other way around. And again, because we, have, we account for body composition, this all happens without any difference on the carcass composition at the end of the day. That's like, uh, I should have, there is no effect on our product. So, uh, these are some heifers that uh, we housed at the uh, Maritime uh, Station a couple years ago. It was an interesting game here. Uh, we had a collaboration of 22 different producers that brought their heifers to sum up a total of 144 heifers. And uh, we did quite a bit of work with those heifers. And so this is pretty much how we end up going, going for that trans test. We have produced for all the uh, across the three provinces. Uh, some guys like this one, I remember he came all the way from Cape Breton. That's that lone star there to, 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 to bring the halfers and then he brought two halfers to the test. Uh, and also another thing that I find quite interesting, there are so many kids around to bring the halfers. So for me it's quite nice to see that because that's another concern that I have about the beef industry is who will be the next generation. So I, I really work hard on that to have more and more young people involved in the industry. Mm. And let's make a, a very simple example here for understanding very well this idea of feed efficiency. You basically in a population of people, you have some people that's very short, some people that's very tall, and most of us are kind of in the middle. So when you look to feed efficient, that's the very same idea. You have some that are very efficient, some that are very inefficient, and then the, the average animals. Mm. And this, this is all average data here. So this is all uh, grass silage. And what I'm telling you here is that an uh, efficient animal was consuming uh, 10 kilos less of grass silage a day than an inefficient animal. So that's quite a bit of feed. And let's work with those numbers a, a bit more. So if you take uh, 10 kilos of uh, grass silage as fed, and then you make that into a dry matter basis, you talk about 3.8 kilos. And then if you do that and extrapolate to what it is in a year, you talk about about 1,300 kilos of uh, dry matter, which if you extrapolate that into bales of hay or 400 kilos, you're talking about four bales of hay uh, that an efficient animal would be consuming less a year than an inefficient one. And then uh, playing with that number a little bit more, uh, I think this number might, this value might be a bit changed, but let's assume that's correct. So you talk about like a uh, savings of $140 uh, on feed efficiency for the efficient animals and then if you do that this on a replacement heifer that you expect to have that animal in your herd for about 10 years uh, that animal can be saving you about $1,300 which is uh, uh, until a couple, month, uh, a couple months ago was the price of half, half replacement heifer so yes there is a potential there and uh, here is like a no treatment Nothing special other than uh, understanding what's the difference in the animals and picking the ones that are better. So, and the same idea that we have for the heifers, these are feedlot animals. Uh, these guys here are consuming a, a diet that takes 90% of corn. So very, it's like a, even a, <laughs> too, much, too much corn for a chicken, I guess. 
And uh, we found here that uh, on a daily basis, the, uh, the efficient land was consuming 1.7 kilos less of that uh, rich ration, which in the, uh, at the end of the feed lodger talk about 250 to 300 kilos of a ration that has 90% of corn. It's just a feed efficient, there is no difference here uh, in body composition or anything else. So yes, there is a, 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 some advantages of that, on that. However, uh, for measure uh, feed efficiency, uh, for doing that like, uh, uh, like uh, without any other support, we need to, to, me to measure feed intake. And to measure feed intake, uh, you might need a very fancy system that may, might not be uh, suitable to a commercial farm. Uh, you can use the Cullen gates that uh, if you don't have back pain, you can go for it, otherwise mm -hmm. it would be pretty tiring. Uh, so there are some limitations for measuring feed intake because you need to do that for about 80 days uh, to get a good estimate of the intake uh, of the animal. Uh, and also to make a proper assessment of feed efficiency, uh, you need to record weight on a regular basis, you need to know body composition, so you need to do ultrasound, and knowing the date of birth of the animal is also a, a big assistance. So yes, uh, we have some, some barriers to, to, to do that assessment. And that's why uh, we have been working in, in ways of uh, finding direct manners of uh, assessing feed efficiency. And the direct manners that I propose are basically uh, 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 focused on physiological differences. So let me introduce that better to you. So basically, uh, we have an animal here uh, that's consuming a certain amount of feed, and then a portion of that to be absorbed. And what's absorbed is either go for body composition or for growth or to supply the maintenance. And when I say maintenance, I'm talking about heart function, whatever it is that's not meat, that is not, uh, not carcass composition, that. So basically, the animal that is better uh, in producing more and, uh, and have a less increase in, in maintenance, that's more efficient. And the other way around is the less efficient one. So there is quite a bit of uh, the size of the engine and how much that uh, car can drive you, basically. So uh, this is some of the areas that you have been doing uh, work. Uh, so goals are around different uh, uh, energetic sinks or how the animal could be expending energy uh, for his uh, daily basis survival basically. And we don't have time to go through all this, but I'll be picking some of those examples uh, and give you like a, an idea of how, how the, those indirect assessments may work. So uh, the first one is liver. I really like liver in general. Uh, liver is interesting, uh, it accounts for 1.2% of the body weight of the animal, but it uh, takes 25% of the energy. So that's a very big uh, energetic sink on that. And then uh, what to do? You want to understand how much oxygen, how much uh, metabolism that, that the organ has. So the same idea here that you have uh, in this system, uh, that little goldfish, and people are measuring how much oxygen that, goat, uh, that goldfish is consuming, we do that with the liver of the animal. So basically, uh, very gently, we get a chunk of liver from the animal through a, a quick surgery. It's like about four to six grams, and then you put in that, that little system, and then you measure how much oxygen the animal is consuming. And we did this with uh, 36 heifers, uh, and this is what we observed. We observed that uh, the efficient animal consumes uh, uh, more energy, uh, more, uh, has a, like a higher metabolic rate uh, in the liver, uh, meaning that this animal has a more functional death, so it's more being processed there, and that's one of the reasons that might support a better performance of, of that animal in comparison to the inefficient one. Uh, this is, I'm not telling you that uh, we should go back home and dig a hole in our heifer and check that out. That's, like, that's really like a demonstration. We have a way less invasive ways of doing uh, similar assessments, but this really bring, um, shows clearly that uh, our efficient animal has a, a 6% higher metabolic, liver, uh, metabolic rate in the liver. So another one that is still a little bit invasive uh, is the use of uh, um, um, bolus, uh, intraluminal bolus, and in this case here uh, we're sticking a bolus, a bolus to measure uh, room pH and also temperature. Uh, and uh, through that we also can uh, get uh, rumen fluid and like really check the composition of the rumen fluid. So it's, uh, it's a lot of work with the, the green solution after filtration and etc. <coughs> and we found some, something very interesting here. We found that our most efficient animals, they have 76% more bacteria in the rumen than the inefficient ones. 
So the more bacteria have the rumen, the better be the digestion. So that's really uh, another way to support that uh, the fish antenna has a different metabolism. Okay. Uh, we also did the, the room and pH temperatures because pH is quite important for acidosis and all those uh, disturbs that you can have in the rumen. And we observed that uh, efficient animals in general they have a consistently uh, lower temperature. So this is over the day, so from midnight until midnight next day. And we did that, this in on, over 10 days. And what we observed here is that uh, efficient animals they have they spend more time within the optimal pH for digestion. So they really have something different that uh, the environment in the room are way, way better for uh, digesting the food. Uh, and then this is a bit uh, not so conventional. Um, we basically here, we vaccinate our animals against chicken egg or uh, albumin, so the white, part, the white part of the egg. Of course, they didn't go to the grocery store to pick the egg to do that. We have a lab grade material for doing that. But why we did that? Why vaccinate an animal against chicken egg? First, because I never saw her eating egg, so I'm pretty sure she never uh, had experience of that protein before, so that's a very novel protein for her. And it's like us when you do a reaction test or something, when you have a new antigen, a new challenge to your body, you have a, a, a specific reaction to that. So that's, uh, that was our target here. So we did, like, a, as you do a, do a normal vaccination, like a first one shot, and then the booster, and then uh, uh, follow up uh, uh, blood collection. And what we observe on that? We observe that our efficient heifers, uh, when you check one specific immunoglobin, it's called IgM, uh, they had a higher response of that immunoglobulin. So what, what that means? It means that our, our uh, efficient heifers, they have a better health barrier. They might be uh, more responsive to a new threat to their health system and to, to, to some extent I might, I might be demonstrating here that they might be a better health status as well. So that's good because you're, you, you, you might be improving feed efficiency and at the same time might be improving the health status of your herd. So I'm very happy with this data here. And another one, this is about fun. Uh, this is uh, one of my grad students that will be uh, defending his, ma his master's in a couple weeks. His name is Jasper Muro. And we did what we call the umbrella challenge. So it doesn't cost much, you just go to a dollar store and buy two dollars uh, umbrella. Actually buy more than one because they break a lot. Uh, and then uh, what are we what are doing here? You're challenging those heifers uh, with the umbrella. You put them in the chute and then let it come down. And then out of the blue, Jasper just end, ends up and open the umbrella three, three times in front of the face of the heifer. And then some of them freak out badly, some other not so bad. Uh, and this is what happens here at the end, like the scientific part of it, although the farm, the farm part is pretty cool. Uh, so this is what, like this is like the four minutes that to give like peace to the heifers. It's just there, wonder what's going on. And then when you open the umbrella, the heart rate goes up, and then start coming down. Yeah. And uh, what to observe? Uh, we observe that our efficient heifers. When they're exposed to the umbrella, they overreact to that. They have, they have like a very stronger, uh, re uh, like heart heart rate increase than the inefficient ones, and that has a lot to do with uh, how animals respond to, to a threat. And the animal that's more responsive is the animal that's more likely to survive in the wild. So there's something on that. Like there's more biology for us to understand here. But what's really important for me here to tell you is that uh, with that simple five minutes in the shoot, we could figure out a lot of what's uh, efficient to what is an inefficient animal. <coughs> okay, so that's it for heifers. And let's talk a, a little bit about the boys now. Um, we have been doing a lot of the bulls. Um, it takes quite a bit of um, um, time to sample a bow and then if, I'm st if I stay around I just start thinking like oh, as you're here waiting for this you can just always be collecting more stuff and that's why we end up doing a lot of things in there so as traditionally like uh, we get semen and then we do scrotal circumference and then we get a blood sample um, I did my PhD on infrared imaging so it's quite interesting to keep going and do some more thermography, thermography like that's thermal image of this scrotum uh, also, we do uh, ultrasound of the testicles, and for the balls that I end up with uh, being slaughtered, uh, then we can really check the tissue of the, the, the testicles, uh, the microtubules, like uh, right here is where the sperm is produced.
Okay, so uh, one assessment to do is really uh, sperm motility. That's very important to see uh, how sperms are swimming and in what direction, see if, the good, if, see if the, there's a good prevalence of good swimmers uh, in that uh, pool of semen. So that's one part of it. And then the second part that, uh, oh sorry, we still have more. more oh, let's see. oh yeah. Uh, we go back to that. Another assessment that we do is uh, sperm morphology. So this is what to expect from, from a, a good swimmer. Uh, nice head and then a, a straight tail. Uh, and then those are all bad swimmers. This is a dead one. That one has a, a proximal droplet that is very bad for, for swimming and uh, fertilization. That one doesn't even have a tail. And that one has a coiled tail. Um, uh, among other uh, many other uh, 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 issues that you have with, with sperm. And these are some uh, data that you have. Um, here I'm showing you that uh, uh, in general when it comes to semen quality, uh, sees that uh, the inefficient bulls, the devil ones end up having a better quality. So having work on that to understand what is a bull that's efficient, that has good semen. And this is like uh, right now is the main focus of my research is to flip the coin on these and be able to identify them that are efficient and have good semen. But so far, I need to report to you that uh, a lot of times, uh, inefficient animals, uh, they have uh, better motility, they have a better, uh, uh, higher proportion of oh. sperm that uh, swims uh, straight. Uh, then when it comes to morphology, they also end up having a better morphology than the efficient ones. So we still need to do some more work on this. And here we talk about young bulls. We talk about uh, uh, early bulls, and not talk about a full mature bull. Uh, there's a great chance that uh, a bull that's not doing so well uh, to catch up on that later on. But uh, at the time of the test, when like I'm preparing the animals for sale, uh, this might be an issue on that. Okay. Uh, yeah. And another thing that we, we observe is that uh, our efficient bulls uh, they tend to have I store uh, a smaller scrotal circumference. Mm -hmm. So, scrotal circumference, I always consider scrotal circumference, a village that gain it, and, and back fat, probably the ribeye area, the main traits that uh, people consider on sale. So, what I'm, I'm suggesting here, what I'm uh, seeing is that, seeing that the efficient <laughs> animals might have a smaller scrotal circumference. So, we need to do more work to, to, to ensure that we improve the efficiency, <laughs> but to bring along uh, the good fertility. Uh, and then, um, just a, a continuation of that, we did some work with the infrared images, so this is us uh, taking pictures of the scrotum here, and that's the thermal image of the scrotum. Uh, that's interesting when you put in this pattern here, because you can see that uh, the bottom is cooler and the top is warmer, and this is exactly what you expect from a health uh, scrotum, it's like a, a gradual change in, in temperature from warmer to cooler, so that's great. And so we did some measurements here to measure the temperature at the base, at the bottom, and also around the, the entire test code. And this is uh, what you observe here. Uh, what really matters here is the, this two here. And it, it, it's indicating to us that uh, the efficient animal that have cooler uh, test codes uh, at the bottom part. And when our organ is cooler, it's a sign that it has a lower metabolic rate. So it's a, it's a sign that uh, there's less things going in there than what you have for a more uh, metabolic active one. So this is really a, a de demonstration that, uh, that matches what you just present because if your semen quality is not good, it's probably because there is a lower metabolic rate in the Tesco and this is a, a temperature showing that yes, there is uh, less things going in there for sure. Um, and then this is uh, another part, it is that uh, Scott, um, test is uh, ultrasound which is quite interesting to do, very easy to do and it's basically um, uh, the ultrasound image uh, the more water, uh, the less tissue you have in our organ the lower is the, the echo that it generates so basically that's what's going on here uh, our efficient animals, uh, they're still in development so their testicle, they have, uh, they have a lower a pixel intensity so they have uh, it's almost like uh, talk about marbling, it's, uh, it's, it's just as the, if they have less marbling here, if, uh, for the sake of a better uh, 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 an analogy for that. Uh, but all this come along to tell the same story. Uh, this, uh, 
efficient animals and young, we need to do some work to understand why their sexual maturity is a bit delayed. Okay, and just to, to wrap this up, um, well, like for the animals that had a chance to, to, to check their, their um, the, the shoe and the, and the testes, so this is like uh, the three different maturation uh, stages of uh, a, a tube in the, within the testes. And this is a very mature, this is gain maturity, and this is a full mature. Uh, in this one you can even start seeing the sperms starting to detach, so that's really uh, a mature uh, tube. And then we observe that uh, the efficient ones, they have uh, a lower predominance of mature uh, 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 tubules in, in, in the, in the test. So yeah, all telling us the same story. Yeah, so um, this is important because uh, this is a, is a type of our research that has been created some um, debate. Um, some people don't want people like me talk about this. But I just find important to bring up the, that you understand what's going on and like uh, you act uh, on the beef industry timely, um, so that it, it cannot be facing the same challenges as some other industries have by focusing so much on efficiency but leaving behind the reproduction side. So I think that's very important to work that uh, in a proactively manner. And another thing that I want to bring up, uh, not related to both. But it's really uh, the work that we do is like uh, is studying a bow in a, in a like for a sale. So there's so much more work that needs to be done and understand uh, where that bow where that bow is going. That bow is being purchased and is going to a farm that uh, really need that bow or that's the best bow for that farm. That's something that uh, is still a bit unclear sometimes, and that's why we need some more uh, uh, support on that when it comes to extension. And yeah, um, and. At the end of the day, uh, feed efficiency is like uh, the cherry on the sundae, you know, it's like uh, adds value to it, it's great if you can make a sundae and then put a cherry on it, but uh, if you don't work on the base, if you don't have a good ice cream, if you, get, if you don't have good nuts, good cream, uh, you cannot go much far on that. So, uh, like, uh, I, have, um, I have been dedicating a lot of my years in feed efficiency, but uh, a lot of times when I go to visit a farm or try to study a production system, uh, we're talking about like some very elemental, uh, fundamental issues that uh, there's no feed efficiency to make a miracle on that. We're talking about uh, situations that you go to a farm and there's no even a herd structure, there's not even like a breeding season. So there is no miracle that you can do with feed efficiency if you don't fix your management uh, first. Uh, and just to wrap this up, I uh, have some uh, opportunities uh, to share uh, with you, some of the, our ongoing work. So this is a system that uh, I built a couple of years ago. It took me seven months to get it going. And uh, it really is like it's the size of a fridge. And then you can measure all the gases that the animal uh, inhale or exhalate. And that's very good for understanding greenhouse gases and all those, those uh, issues. So I'm finally getting a way to get installed in a, in a pen. And it would be great that you can be continued with that uh, type of assessment. It does take quite a bit of work to convince an animal to be here happy, uh, but you can do it. It's a, I would say that about two weeks of work, they will be uh, cool with that. Um, and another work that we have been doing uh, is really like a part of a big project. And I, I put this, uh, this text here just because it was published these days. Uh, it's, a, it's a study showing that uh, we can get uh, EPDs for methane production. So I don't know if the industry is <laughs> ready to accept that, but there is ways today to study the greenhouse gases and have EPDs for that. Which, is, like uh, when you look to the big picture, uh, the beef industry is like is blaming for a lot of the global warming, uh, especially in Canada. is a big portion is given uh, by the beef industry. So there's a there's a possibility that you can be uh, having uh, both in arena and you know, oh this is a low methane emission goal. I don't know if that happens so soon, but uh, that's opportunity for that. And uh, this is just the system that uh, we have been working with uh, from uh, some colleagues from Australia. You see that there is a, a dairy cow, and then like you just put a muzzle with a little um, an inlet here, and then it goes with that spring, and then uh, it gets stuck in those uh, uh, tubes here, and then you can measure the amount of methane that it was producing. Yeah, and with that, I just would like to do some quick announcements. Uh, the work that we do is heavily funded by quite a few different partners. 
and I'm very happy to see to have this support and almost be running off space in this night to, to acknowledge everybody. This is very important, very fundamental that we can do that in the way. And also, of course, that needs a, quite a few octopus to do this. And this is myself and all my little octopus here. These guys here, they work really hard to get this uh, work done. Uh, and goes all the way here for undergrad level to masters. And it's just fundamental to have these people uh, working around. Everybody here uh, is very good in handling animals, uh, handling data sets, um, getting awards and participating <coughs> to conference. So I'm very happy to have them. And finally, couldn't bring it, but those are the two little monsters that uh, keep me straight at home. Mm. And I uh, have been doing some work, uh, I have been developing a home page uh, on YouTube with a lot of videos of, that uh, we have been presenting. So you're very welcome to check it out. And also every single publication that we have, even yeah, very old ones, uh, we also have that site from in the research gate that uh, have a lot of things on feed efficiency, PowerPoint presentations and whatever uh, might, might be needed. Uh, with that, I turn back to you and let's see if you have any questions. Have you been doing any leptin testing in conjunction with your feed efficiency trials? Yes. Yeah. Um, I have a student that uh, did a lot of work on the left thing, and I need to go back to the data right now, but uh, she found she had, she had some difference in that, uh, between efficient and efficient that. I just don't remember exactly in what way you had the difference, but we had a difference on that. Uh, leptin is a very tricky hormone to work with, because I have a, a lot of influence of the amount of fatness in the animal that you have in that. So it's not so simple the interpretation. You, you you go to the literature, you find all different all sorts of results in that. Yeah. We did some work with a testosterone. Testosterone worked pretty well, and uh, we we had evidence that uh, the animals that are less efficient they have higher levels of testosterone throughout the test. So which all makes sense when you look to the reproduction side of it. You said the animals with higher, more bacteria in the rumen were uh, more efficient? Yes, the so feed efficient animals have uh, way more bacteria in the rumen. You transfer bacteria into an inefficient animal? That yeah. So is, that's an interesting question. And like, uh, it just doesn't work like that, in fact. Because uh, who determines the bacteria? The, the bacteria that lives in, in the rumen, it is the animal, it's not the bacteria. So if uh, there is studies where people like swamp the whole the whole room in contact across the animals, and then uh, afterwards this the the bacteria just came back to what what the animal had originally. So it's really a, a genetic a genetic component that determines which type of bacteria the animal has uh, in the room or in the gut. So would they are they eating differently? Like are they eating maybe smaller meals or yeah. bigger meals like the. Is yeah, there, so is there any difference there? Yes, uh, we have some work on that. Uh, it's something that I did in 2010. And the animals that uh, are more efficient, uh, they have a, a slower eating rate. So they eat slower. So that might be suggesting us that they might be chewing more. They might be balancing their pH better because uh, the, more, the slower they eat, uh, the more uh, saliva they produce. So there is a difference on that. There is? Yeah. That maybe explains the pH and, and the bacteria. It, it may explain, yeah, it may, yeah. 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 It's like the way they eat. Yeah. As a producer that sends bulls down to Nepan, have you noticed the last couple of years, I noticed just talking to other producers, a lot of the bulls are having problems with that semen test, but there's yeah. a lot of the good bulls that I've heard. Yeah. And I know we had one bull that was there a couple of years ago, it was maybe one of the most efficient bulls there, and he was sent back because, I don't think he failed the scene test, but it was what, deferred? deferred yeah, and okay. the bull came home and he bred perfectly fine. Yeah. So was there, like, and I know in Solaire's, our breed, the testicle size generally is smaller than some of the other breeds, like semis and stuff. Yeah. So was there two months emphasis, do you think, and like how you said, like I've even heard guys down there saying because it was such a cold winter, and what you <coughs> were saying about the temperature of the testicles, is there any, Merit in that, the type of winter the animals put in. I yeah. know it's cold down in the pan and stuff. Is that yeah. affecting a lot of the bulls in that semen test? Yeah. So there is a, a few things on that, and like I think that uh, for that whole uh, facility, that's uh, where we need more remediation at the moment. Uh, the first thing, 
The swimming test that uh, we do uh, is based like on a, on a veterinary practice. So it's like a, it's a British Soundness evaluation uh, where they have some sort of a catalog that uh, they tells you what's the scrotal circumference of different breeds. And I'm very sure that they never measured a thousand salaries to, to, to tell what's the, what should be the scrotal circumference for salaries at puberty. So there are some limitations on that. And the second part, like uh, I have been working with uh, both at the station here, uh, did, I still do a lot of work in Ontario and uh, back in Brazil with like seed stock, Hanford. <coughs> and for all these three places across, here is like where uh, we have the lowest uh, amount of energy in the ration. So if I am to do a change there, it would certainly be to increase the amount of grain in the diet. That's the first thing. And that's something that there is in this in discussion uh, these days, and they're, they're planning to do that. It's just because then comes the, 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 the price, and some people don't want to put another 50 or 100 dollars a year dish to pay the, the extra cost of feed or the feed. But uh, I think that you end up paying off if you do that. And uh, just uh, your first point is that, is that like uh, let's say if you have an animal that failed on that test, you you expect to retest the animal six weeks. But in the way that you do the work here, you don't have that time. You test the bull like the second week of March and then first week of uh, April you sell the bull. So you don't have that time to do the retest. <coughs> So probably and, 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 definitely the older bulls are definitely tested better on that semen test, like the December's and January's versus any that are got a couple months. It might younger. be. It's a big difference yeah. in a year. It I'm might thinking. be, and also you need to take consideration breeds too, because one thing is like a, a small frame animal, British breed, another is a continental one. So of course that at the same age, the continental breed would be in disadvantage of that. Yeah, and and, and like uh, what you do there is assessment of a bull at a early stage. Right, so uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, most of those bulls, if we retest at a later stage, they probably would pass. But uh, it's like a, you measure the growth of a tree, so that's your time to you do the assessment at that moment. That's your, that's your snapshot that you can do. So that's why, like, uh, you have some some issues like that that uh, we need to work around for sure. Have you found heard complaints yourself, like on that on that yeah, subject uh, quite often? Or yes, uh, a lot of the better bulls getting sent home because of the deferred. Yeah. Tax? Uh, oh. Uh, like uh, and, and it's interesting because let's say I, I am there like uh, for that I'm facilitating uh, the person that uh, when I was doing the, that assessment the person that did the the sim evaluation is like uh, is a professional certified by the Ter America Ter Ter Knowledge of uh, College so that's like they have a regulation that for doing that it's like a somebody that goes officially to measure propane your house or something like that so that's that's uh, their work and then that's the classification right you have a guideline. For that, and if you don't match that, you know that's what it is. So, yeah. You're finding that the bulls with a smaller scrotum are more feed efficient. That's what we observe. Yeah, more feed efficient, smaller scrotum. Yeah. And uh, another part of that is like uh, is the nature of how we test bulls in Canada, because uh, we basically we crowd 140 bulls uh, together. And then what happens? The bull that uh, gets maturity uh, first, the early bull that start fighting head to head, do all that playing that uh, bulls like to do. And because they do that playing uh, and they want to be bossy by the feeder, that uh, consumes a lot of energy, and that what helps them to be inefficient at the end of the day. <laughs> While the one that's still not mature, he doesn't care. He's just laying there, you know. He, he, he doesn't have the uh, to the male attitude to be fighting and, and doing that. So that's something that you still don't factor when you, when you evaluate that. You just uh, like you just uh, go a bit blind on that. So. Is there any correlation between feed efficiency and longevity? Um, I don't know. I never saw a study in that. Um, the thing is, uh, feed efficiency and longevity is basically studying cow herds for a long time. So I think that uh, for the time that the uh, deficiencies come back to surface, I think that people still didn't have enough uh, time to do that uh, type of assessment. Yeah, I hope there is, but I don't know. Yeah. Have you had the time to uh, evaluate the, the offspring of some of these feed efficient bulls to see if they are also feed efficient? Um, I, I personally, I never. Uh, there is plans for the MBTS to start doing that in the summer. I hope that you fly, that would be great. It's but, a variability. Uh, 
Huh? I think the heritability yeah. determined that. 40, they, yeah. 40 something or? Yeah. The thing is, heritability for fitted fishes goes all the way from 0.05 to 0.60 in the literature. Oh. So there is a bit of a range in that. 0.05 to 0.60. Yeah. yeah. Quite a range. Yeah. Yeah. So we need to, to factor that. But uh, there is a lot of studies uh, support that there is heritability in that. So. And just uh, follow up your question about the, the cow herd. Uh, with I said that I did in the past. Uh, it turned out that uh, efficient, uh, efficient females, they, got, uh, they reach puberty earlier in life and they drop a uh, heifer calf. That's the only two pieces of information that I generate in that. Yes, Would you, did you know and notice any difference between the more feed efficient ones in terms of their just resting heartbeat? Yeah, uh, for the resting heartbeat, uh, I didn't show here today just because uh, I had to cut this slide, it was too much. But uh, we observed, uh, those same animals that did the umbrella, uh, we also put the gear overnight, and then we observed that overnight the efficient animal has a lower heartbeat. Yeah. Consistently, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and, and it just flips the relationship when, the, when you stress them. Yeah, and uh, it's, uh, I should have kept this slide, but it's basically also like uh, trans uh, over transportation, the more efficient animals have the lower heart rate when in the truck. Uh, and then when it's in this tiny box, the more efficient animals have a lower uh, heart rate. Yeah. So the more efficient animal is calmer? It's, it's calmer. Like, I, 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 it's a bit hard to say heart rate as a lower heart rate as a calmer, but I can tell right now that it keeps a lower heart rate under different circumstances. Yeah, just like when you have the acute stress as we did with the heifers, uh, then they, they, they overreact a bit.